With us today in this press briefing is Dr. Joy Lochin. He is the program leader, agricultural biotechnology and wildlife at the University of Nairobi. He is going to discuss the utilization of agricultural biotechnology in the fight against climate emergency in Africa. Dr. Chin, who is also the Secretary General of the Kenya University Biotechnology Consortium, Kubiko, a guild of biotechnology experts in Kenya using biotech approaches and innovations for better agriculture, health, and the environment, holds a PhD in genetics and applied biotechnology from the School of Environmental Science and Management, Southern Cross University of New England in Australia. So with us here, Dr. Joel is an expert in, in the field of agribiotechnology. We can see he has a PhD in genetics and applied biotechnology. So maybe before he starts to tell us the role of agribiotechnology in mitigating climate change, he can elaborate what is agribiotechnology because some of us are wondering, this is a very big term. Maybe he can slay the giant for us first before he commences on his presentation. Welcome, Dr. Joel. Yes, uh, thank you, Sharon. And uh, I think uh, I'm going to be as simple as possible because the word biotechnology has caused a considerable level of misunderstanding worldwide, not only in Africa or Kenya, uh, where I come from, but across the world, when you mention the word biotechnology, the first thing that happens is that people's minds are set to believe that you're talking about only one aspect of biotechnology the high end level, which is uh, genetic engineering, the process that results into what we call GMO. So when you use the word biotechnology, people mind, people's mind run to GMO only. It is almost considered synonymous, wrongly considered synonymous to, to GMO. But biotechnology is a tool that is used in accelerating and improving profitability in Agricultural systems, and it includes even the simplest ones that many farmers, traders, and all stakeholders have deployed without even knowing. An example is grafting. Many of us and you are keeping grafted plants or crops in your farms without knowing that that is actually a biotechnology driven product. We use tissue culture. We use as simple as artificial insemination and all that, even vegetative propagation, the way we do it for uh, potatoes. Vegetative propagation in potato, where you, you simply uh, cut off uh, a branching or vine and plant, that is biotechnology. So, we must come to an understanding that biotechnology is a wide term referring to a range of tools that farmers have deployed for centuries and the purpose is to improve productivity in the gradual systems and genetic engineering is just one of them just one of them it is the high end we have genetic engineering we have what we call gene editing and of course experts like i've seen uh, <laughs> my mentor felix majiwa know very well that Gene editing is actually a subset of genetic engineering. The difference is that you are making modification within the species and within the individual animal concerned. You are not doing transgenics. You're not transferring genes from one organism set to another. You're making modification within, such as RNAi or RNA interruption that confers certain desired properties without transferring genes or DNA from any other, other organism. So let's come to that understanding that that's what biotechnology means. A whole range of tools that we have used and that we intend to use, including crossbreeding that farmers have deployed. I was actually born when crossbreeding was already in place and nobody has ever questioned crossbreeding because it has, con it has conferred profits, it has conferred savings on labor and it has circumvented the waiting time that would otherwise be required under conventional uh, agriculture. Thank you. Before I go to my formal presentation, 
that's a brief of what biotechnology is. Thank you so much for that clear definition of what biotechnology is. So as, um, as Tony uh, has already put it up, we are discussing today and by very good design that we have people in Stockholm that are discussing climate change and possible mitigation measures that may accompany all our efforts in reducing what we call uh, climate change, global warming. Those terminologies, we are going to make clear what they are. So generally climate change, and I'm making this definition not because you don't know, but to reiterate, and especially because of the media, you have a key role in educating the public. And the more you get abreast with it, the better that the public will become informed. Now, climate change, we are talking about a simple matter. We are just talking about some long-term shifts in temperatures and weather patterns across the world. And that's the definition given by the United Nations and all other concerned stakeholders in the climate uh, um, change, uh, I call it business. Now, it has several causes. That long-term shift in weather and temperatures has several causes. A key one is um, natural processes, including changes in the sun's energy level, volcanic eruptions, and other disasters that occur naturally without um, human intervention or interference. But we also have human activities that cause climate change. We have uh, the reflectory or absorption capacity of the sun's energy as a result of our actions such as construction of roads that reflect when the sun's rays hit it, it gets absorbed within the atmospheric system and that causes some warming that is then brought back to the surface as higher or elevated levels of temperatures. Then we also have uh, another human activity, perhaps the key one, and the one where our interventions are uh, concerned, which is greenhouse gas emissions. Now, this word has been used so many times, but I want to first compare in the next slide, how the natural causes compare with human mediated causes. Because there's been uh, several talks and many people say that even if I uh, do something, what about the natural causes? And they ask, what are we going to do about it? And the answer is, let's do our part. Let nature do its part. But if you compare the two in that graph, the almost red line, uh, they say men are colorblind. I hope I can see it. The almost red line is the one that uh, represents human activities or human mediated climate change. While the blue line that is uh, fairly moderate underneath is the natural causes. So clearly we can see that human activities cause far much higher level of uh, greenhouse gas emission and hence climate change compared to natural systems. So that means that much will be done, especially if human behavior or human actions change. There will be a much greater change than trying to remove volcanoes, for example. <laughs> so in the next slide, I'm going to tell you and share with you and discuss with you what is this? Because people have been hearing about these words, greenhouse gas emission, greenhouse gas emission. Sometimes you wonder what exactly is this? Why is it green? So we are talking about a fact that there are gases that absorb and trap heat in the Earth's atmosphere. And when that happens, there is a trigger. It causes an increase in the average global temperatures. And when we use the word greenhouse gases, we are simply saying gases that do that, which I've just said. They trap and absorb heat in the sun's atmosphere and trigger a change in the global temperatures to be higher. And they say 
that um, this century has seen the highest change in global temperatures ever. And that even the UN uh, talks about uh, the, la the last year, that is 2021, as the highest ever. And so there's a red flag, something must be done. Now, there are many gases that do this. An example is carbon dioxide, just in the same, same slide, the carbon dioxide is one. Then we have methane that is produced from so many uh, activities, human activities, including animal agriculture, but of course, including um, doing nothing, which means as long as you live in a house and uh, we remove excess products from our bodies, that is part of what releases methane, um, especially when used by a digester and when the anaerobic uh, bacteria and other organisms try to digest that, then it releases methane. There are of course many other gases, but those two are key. I know there are many others, including carbon monoxide that is released from other industrial processes, such as driving motor vehicles that are not in good um, engine order that release more carbon monoxide. And there's something that should be used in mitigating that. But we find that uh, there are cases where vehicle owners or drivers remove it uh, because then it doesn't shock the vehicle and other burning of uh, fossil fuel that reduces many other, and refrigeration, we use refrigerators in our homes. So all that account for uh, greenhouse gas emission, but to point that methane, when methane comes in contact with the oxygen, it becomes more potent than almost 300 times more potent than carbon uh, dioxide because it actually changes to carbon dioxide and that, that process releases uh, more heat into the environment. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, but first, let's also ask ourselves one question. We are talking about climate change. Why are we worried? Why does it concern us? What is the problem? if average temperatures and, and, and weather patterns change. It transects across the whole human spectrum, from agriculture to normal living. Because for example, you have hurricanes and, and tornadoes in some of the Western countries. It destroys homes, destroys roads, carries away vehicles, displaces millions of people. And in any case, when you have extreme weather conditions, we have emergent pathogens that were not doing very well in the default temperature and, and weather patterns. But when there's a change, you see emergent pathogens that may now do much better. In fact, as we talk now, the whole world has a challenge in what we call COVID-19. And predictions are that when the areas get humid, then the transmission system is enhanced. So these are some of the things that uh, are with us and we have examples. If you have rice in sea levels, then we have invasive plants that now move inland because the inland um, temperatures and, and weather patterns are now favorable for their survival. And most importantly for me especially, is that those unpredictable weather patterns affect food production. More critical for me, more critical for Africa where food scarcity is a problem and more critical for the rest of the world because it's a global village where there's no food in Africa, there's no food everywhere because trade is a single unit called the world. And we have wildlife uh, because I lead a program in wildlife that also suffer as a result because they get new predators that now come to capture the territory, they face food scarcity, and even the marine life is affected. So, so it, it affects us all in one way or another when we have a climate change. So in the next slide, I'm showing you that people have made attempts to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions as a key aspect that leads to climate change. One of the methods used 
uh, in especially that uh, was discovered in the US, are the simple things in animal nutrition. They are talking about adjusting the balance of diet in farm animals. And they have done experiments and they have shown that when you use more corn in animal feed, then the, the microbes that digest corn are different from the other ones. And they have a lowered level of methane production. So that's one way of inherently reducing methane emissions. Because then it has what we call hydrogen sink. When you have uh, that system, there is another system which is not critical for the media that takes away hydrogen. And so there is less hydrogen available for methane production. That's the mechanism of action. But uh, uh, there are so many limitations to this um, trial because one, even though this it cannot be called a limitation because there will be about seven to 10 percent change, margin of change in, in, in methane emissions, which is good if it works. Because even if you change one percent and every other person changes one percent, there is some reduction. But the biggest problem is that um, the results of an unbalanced diet might interfere with the production of the animal. Remember, in my vision, all trials and all methods that we are going to use in reducing climate change must also be people-centered. It must maintain the farmer's initial purpose of even keeping the animal in the first place. There must be productivity. If it's going to lower production, then it means the farmer will have to keep more cows, which again, we are coming back to the same problem. If one cow is going to be less productive because we have changed the diet, then for him to remain at the same profit margin, he'll be tempted to keep more flock, a bigger flock. So we are back to the same problem. Because at the end of the day, we want people to keep fewer livestock when they're more productive. So the next and perhaps a counterproductive uh, challenge is that uh, we have to therefore grow more corn. If you're going to use more corn in the, in the feed, you have to grow more corn. And when you plow land, you are exposing the reflectory aspects of the sun's rays. And therefore, you are now causing the natural aspects of climate change. So we are back to round 22. So that is one trial. The next one is uh, adding supplements that slow down methane production. An example is seaweed. These are trials that have already been published. An example is seaweed, where they, they add red algae to cattle feed. But they have done this trial in an artificial rumen of a cow. Not rumen inside the cow, artificial rumen outside the, cow, the animal. And it uh, demonstrated an overwhelming reduction in methane production by 90%. <clears throat> but of course, there's a serious limitation that um, they have to progress from there to a real cow because um, an artificial stomach is different from an actual cow. And of course, then they will move ahead to study the effect of that on production. And if that has to be outscaled, Will we now grow seaweed or what are we going to do? So these are some of the questions that arise. But of course, uh, we appreciate those um, cutting edge trials because if it can address the two limitations, then we are good. The third one, of course, is uh, where you capture the methane. You capture and purify the methane for domestic use or for whatever other use. Um, so once you capture them, then the gas can be utilized uh, for several purposes. And in fact, uh, if you have a large herd, then you will get enough methane for household, run your household. But if you have to capture methane from um, animals, 
it means one thing that all the animals have to be kept in. They have to be kept in a specific place, enclosed, for example, at all times. And that may not work for Africa, where we have pastoral groups who move from place to place with their cattle. We have groups that do um, non zero grazing. We are more used to outdoor kind of agriculture, animal agriculture. And then the animal welfare issues will arise. Because when you keep the animals in, they become unhappy. And therefore, we can predict, therefore, that uh, the production level will decrease. Ha happy animals, more production. Less happy animals, lower production. Then now, you have to keep more cows. Back to square one. So with all that, I, I would want to show you uh, with acknowledgement to the person um, whose copyright this covers, that the basis of my three research projects and extension project is on what you can see there. We normally have certain microorganisms in the tummy of a cow within the rumen. You know, these are ruminants. So they have one of the chambers is called rumen. And what happens there is that when you bring in feed, when the cow feeds, then it's broken down and that process releases methane, which is then expelled from the rumen through two main uh, avenues. One is uh, the animal will burp, or you call it belching, and also the animal will shit, cow dung, and the dung also releases methane. So the two systems. So the projects we are talking about therefore cover the two aspects, the two avenues through which methane is released from the cow. And one of them is as simple as a, an extension issue. But the first one is a transmitochondrial genetics for domestic livestock. In the next slide. And the goal is to develop farm animals with feed efficiency. That is feed conversion efficiency. And the first step is use uh, swine or pigs. Pigs are both uh, domestic species that we intend to use, using for two purposes. One, as a model for discovery of uh, the method. And second is that we keep it as well. It's one of the animals that we intend, one of the target species for modification. Because energy production is domiciled within the mitochondrion and if we target genes that are involved in oxidative uh, phosphorylation, then we can modulate or regulate the metabolism within the cells for energy production. And this is intended to reduce the amount of feed that the animal needs to obtain the same amount of energy. So that is what I'm calling feed conversion efficiency, where you feed the animal less than you have always fed it, and it will release the same amount of energy for the animal from less feeding. <clears throat> now, that will give us two things. One is that it will improve productivity because the farmer now spends less. As I said, all our methods have to be farmer-centered. The farmer will feed the animal less, so he's saving money. The cost of production goes down. While at the same time, because of less feeding, there is less emission from, for, of methane into the environment. So we are killing, I hear people say, killing two birds with one stone. Now, at the end of the day, our purpose, is to introduce the intact mitochondrial genome of those selected gene, genes or sequences from the swine into seed stock of the domestic normal swine for improvement. So at the moment, we are working on the transfer technology <coughs> and optimizing that method. Once we have optimized the method, then now we will uh, apply. Of course, we have a regulatory system in Kenya the National Biosafety Authority, 
apply to be allowed to do modification of animals. And we see, because again, as we talk about this project, we must bear in mind, some of you might have lived in Kenya or in the East African region where I think our challenges are similar, that we have a crisis, a very, very serious crisis of feed. Feeds are not there. And when you find any, they are way unaffordable to the farmer. So we have a serious problem of feed. And if this project can reduce feeding, while at the same time mitigating climate change, the better. So the second uh, project is an extension one in the next slide. And it is as simple as convincing people to change their way of doing agriculture. It's a, a simply an extension project that uh, convinces farmers to have components that complement each other in their system. We have a fishery, uh, I mean, aquaculture really. Fishery is the, is the natural one. We're talking about aquaculture, that is keeping of fish and fish species. I'm using the word fish from a global context, not tilapia only. I'm talking about crabs and all these things. So if you have a aquaculture system that's integrated with your crop system and for example, animal agriculture, the other animal, you know, fish is a, what you call emerging livestock. But now we are talking about integrating emerging livestock, which is fishery or aquaculture with traditional livestock, uh, that is poultry, um, uh, cattle, with crops. So that the purpose is that you can rotate system, the waste within the system. So you get waste from uh, the fish pond, you use it in irrigating your farm, you get waste from the farm, you rotate it back to your animals, and you get animal manure to, to um, we call it fertilize the pond, to fertilize the pond. So you are treating um, waste within the enterprise so that there's less waste going out into the environment. That's uh, an extension one. And it only involves demonstrating and convincing farmers to do so. Now, the last project, which is actually basic research as well, is the use of plant saponins to reduce uh, the processes that initiate the production of uh, methane into the environment. Now, saponin is a plant uh, secondary uh, compound, and we're using that as a, a strategy to mitigate uh, the methane production. It's a natural alternative, and therefore we expect it to be more accepted uh, because all our efforts may be wasteful if we are going to produce something that the people will not buy or a method that the government will not buy or a method that the farmers will not adopt. So the extracts, of course, there are many extracts in plant, from plants. We have tannins, we have saponins, we have essential oils. But one problem is that uh, tannins, uh, we have done testing, tannins are fairly toxic even to the animal. So we are focusing on saponins. Uh, one of the things we've done is that we have actually extracted all the compounds, pure compounds. In the next slide, we have published that. And our purpose initially was to look at whether the traditional medicine uh, people, whether they had a basis because they were using a, a particular tree to treat um, several things, many things. As you know, in traditional medicine, <laughs> there's no limit. Once a, a plant is known to cure anything, then it is postulated to cure all manner of things. So we isolated the pure compounds, tested them. We have tested it on, uh, on, on whether it can reduce uh, emissions in vitro. Of course, we have not done, gone to the animal yet. But one of the things we have already observed is that uh, combination of compounds can give misleading results. And therefore, you need to work with pure compounds. Because of, there are questions where, and um, uh, Dr. Majewa is, uh, Professor Majewa is actually a biochemist. And he can tell you that uh, when compounds become antagonistic, instead of working with each other, they work against each other. 
So that's the basis of using pure compounds, whether it is in traditional medicine or in the work we tend to do. Now, our hypothesis in the next slide for this work is that we are intending to decrease protein degradation using saponin because it's known to, to decrease uh, protein degradation. And so it will therefore, in that case, favor microbial protein and biomass uh, synthesis. And in our previous testing, we demonstrated that uh, saponins had some level of anti protozoal effect, but publications have shown that that effect is transient. Why that concerns us is one, is one thing, that we don't want to introduce anything into the animal that will interfere with the rumen microbiome. By rumen microbiome, I mean there are several microorganisms in the rumen, some which are very helpful, and if they're not there, then some of the functions will be impaired. So we are taking care as well to ensure that what we're introducing does two things. One, maintains the function of the rumen microbiology, microbiome, that's the other, the microorganisms that are there, and does not interfere with the productivity of the animal. Those are the two things we take care of. Take care of. So if this system can reduce the availability of hydrogen for methane production, we are sure that the emissions will be reduced. And because methane reduces the energy available to the cow, metabolizable energy for up to between seven and 12%. So that means if we can reduce methane, then we can as well improve on the energy available to the animal. So when you improve the, the energy available for that, to the animal, then you are as well improving productivity. And in other words, also meaning that you can even feed less. So at the moment, um, if you show the next slide, we have reached at the in vitro uh, level. We are moving down. That once that is done, in vitro it shows 39% reduction. Then now we'll move to the Roman model. And if that works, I think we are heading uh, in the right direction. And we hope that we'll succeed. We hope that it will work in the real cow <laughs> and that it can be deployed in large scale. That will also require public education for people to understand, and then we can deploy. But as we do all this, we need a very strong level of policy support because climate change will not be reduced. If you show the next slide, will not be reduced without a very strong police support in two aspects, especially. One um, is that you need to have policies that are directly and intentionally geared towards reducing emissions, especially in construction, transport. That is the next slide we're talking about. And in agriculture or agricultural policy, we need policies that cover the use of livestock manure because if you use livestock manure when it is raw, then the likelihood that you're going to release methane into the environment is 100%. So farmers need to be educated on what to do when they get their manure. Instead of taking it to the farm the same day, they need to be shown what to do to compost it in a way that some of these things decay before it is deployed into the farm. And also, when the policy supports productivity gains of any type, it means that we are likely to use less animals, which will translate to fewer or more, less emissions from fewer animals. Now, one of the simplest methods that uh, we can have, which is, I'm not doing the research on, is that we can do selection, normal selection for, because as you know, not every animal releases the same level of methane, not every breed of animal, for example, releases the same level of methane. So we can do selection for lower methane emission 
with animals. The question is whether the lower emitter will also be a more productive animal. Uh, I'm sure that question can be answered anyway, but we need to start trying that. Do selection, and we can even use marker assisted selection for methane production. So that when an animal is born, you don't have to wait until it's an adult to know that this one emits less. We can use marker assisted selection to do early selection for animals that re release less methane. But as we will argue out, we have to be sure that the lower emitter is also a more productive cow because the farmer is interested in production anyway. And uh, all of us, including the media, governments, researchers, and other stakeholders, we have to have a united front in enhancing awareness among the people because there are many things we can do on our own without governments being involved that can reduce emissions. And that will be embedded within behavior change. We must not focus on production only. We need to focus on both production and environmental health. This which I'm doing, it is making me productive, but does it also reduce the assault that we have on the environment? There are the little things we can do on our own and the little contribution each of us can make will participate in overall reducing methane emissions in the environment, releasing carbon dioxide in the environment and many other gases. And also we need to take care of our forests so that we have less areas that are reflecting back the sun rays. And governments must put in place systems that does continuous monitoring so that all interventions can be targeted at hotspots of methane emission, hotspots of gas uh, emissions that ultimately contribute to um, high levels of temperature and weather changes, which is calling, uh, which we are calling climate change. I think I will stop there and uh, spend the rest of the time discussing because some of you here are experts in uh, various parts. And I was saying, I was happy to see uh, Felix Madiva, <laughs> who was my mentor. Uh, we can have a very, very productive discussion. Thank you.